gravitational wave. Uh, the gravitational wave open science uh, center. And uh, if you're interested in getting a little bit more hands on training on on any aspects of gravitational wave data analysis, I'm just posting in the chat uh, a link you might have hopefully received this via uh, email, some announcement. And so the the gravitational wave open science um, is holding another workshop uh i believe it's in may and so if you're interested in that you can follow this link and um and maybe sign up for that for that workshop so uh for a bit more hands-on activities and i will today be go just going into a bit more of the theory uh behind some of these analyses all right so today i'll mostly be focusing on bayesian inference and so just taking through a very basic tour of uh, Bayesian probability theory, Bayesian learning, model selection, some of the techniques we use to uh, carry out uh, this inference uh, in, in practice. And then I'm gonna get on to some other more advanced topics uh, towards the end. And as yesterday, uh, if you have questions, please um, pop them in the chat and I'll monitor the chat as best I can. And, and try and answer them on the fly. So, uh, as I was talking about yesterday, uh, a lot of the, for probably various historical reasons, as well as some practical constraints, a lot of the analyses uh, in ground-based gravitational wave astronomy have been uh, not done in a Bayesian way. Uh, that's changing. Um, it's becoming increasingly uh, under, the framework of Bayesian uh, probability theory. So I find the, the Bayesian way of doing things just very natural. Um, I think it's a very natural expression of the, uh, of the scientific method. And the idea is you basically have some initial understanding, which is based on your prior observations. And, and uh, then you take in some, you know, make some new observations and that leads you to your sort of uh, sorry, updated understanding. So it's a pr progression of learning essentially through observation. And in the uh, mathematical formulation, uh, your initial understanding is reflected in your, um, the prior distribution on whichever parameters might describe your model. Then you bring in new observations, which uh, is encoded in the likelihood. So the likelihood of having observed that data given uh, this collection of parameters. And then your updated understanding is the posterior, uh, which is then a probability distribution of those parameters now informed by the new data. So <clears throat> this is encoded, and I've already had this on a slide yesterday, encoded in Bayes' theorem, which says that the posterior distribution, you get it from the product of the prior and the likelihood and then there's this normalizing factor just to make sure that these are still probabilities, so normalized to integrate to one. Um, so there's just the, the normalizing factor. That, that normalizing factor, though, is not completely trivial. It, it is, it's important. It actually is something I'll talk a little bit more about. It's the, it's the evidence for a model. So then you can do model comparison. If you have uh, two different models, you can compare their evidence and uh, find which one uh, is better supported by the, by the data. Now, once you <clears throat> have uh, computed your posterior distribution, it really encodes everything you could hope to ask about the, about the data. So you can do things like calculate expectation values. So if you want to know the value of a, you know, the, the expected value of a particular parameter, say the mass of a system or the spin, um, that's got by, you know, just the weighting of the, uh, that parameter integrated over the probability distribution. And you can uh, create what are known as um, marginalized posterior distributions where you integrate out all the other variables. So uh, for a generic um, eccentric and spinning binary, it would be, a, say, a 17-dimensional parameter space. But if I only want to know about, say, the chirp mass, I can integrate out 16 of those other parameters and just produce a distribution on the, on the chirp mass. So we often see these so-called marginalized um, probability distributions. And another, 
another quantity that you'll see um, quoted quite often are the uh, <clears throat> are the credible regions. Uh, so, for example, if I want to find where 90% of the probability lies, I can just integrate until I get, uh, you know, and there's different, you can, you can center these distributions different ways, but these are, are just regions that contain certain amounts of the probability. So this, this really, uh, once you've got the posterior distribution, you can, you can find out everything you would like to ask about the data. Um, <clears throat> So, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, the Bayesian approach was really developed by Laplace. Um, I mean, Bayes uh, obviously came up with, with some of this, but Laplace really made it into a full science. And <clears throat> uh, it's a quote, uh, I won't do it in French, this is just the English translation. Uh, the, uh, and he didn't call it Bayesian uh, probability theory, but uh, his quote is, the Bayesian theory of probabilities is basically just common sense reduced to calculus. So um, this sort of natural expression of the scientific method of just updating your understanding about the world as you take in new observations and just a mathematical way of formulating that. Uh, another quote that I quite, uh, quite like is due to a statistician um, called Lindley, and his, uh, his quote is, uh, today's posterior is tomorrow's prior. The idea is, you have your prior, you update it with new observations, it becomes your posterior distribution. But then if you're going to now collect more observations, your posterior that you had is now your prior because it's what you've updated to. And you can actually, um, I have some nice illustrations of this, not in this lecture, but <clears throat> uh, for example, you can analyze the data from a single LIGO detector. And as you remember from yesterday, that gives you this big um, uncertainty in the sky location because it's just a single detector and you might think that you have to analyze the data from two detectors simultaneously to then narrow it to a ring but the way that it works in uh, Bayesian uh, learning is you can just analyze the data from one detector that gets you your new posterior distribution that now becomes a prior and now you fold in the data from the second detector and somewhat miraculously, it seems, it now forms up a sky ring. Um, so you can actually just sequentially add in the data from each detector, and you'll get the same result as analyzing all of the data simultaneously. So this updating of the information. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> you can quantify how much you're learning from an observation by measuring the distance between two distributions. So if I have a probability distribution, our prior distribution of the parameters, and then you have your posterior distribution, what you get after doing the observations, this quantity here, the kulbach liebler divergence, it actually measures the distance between two distributions, and it's log base two, so it's measured in bits. So it's bits of information that you learn from an observation. So you can actually quantify how many bits of information you learnt uh, in doing an observation. And just to give you an example of that, here is a, uh, <clears throat> a LIGO observation. I forget which system it is. It doesn't really matter for the current discussion. Um, and this is a, uh, a plot, a two-dimensional plot, but this is now marginalized out. So you've integrated out the mass dependence and everything. And it's just focusing on these two spin parameters, which I'll define a little bit later, chi effective and chi p, which are the um, <clears throat> tell you different things about the spin distributions. And a key thing to look at here is the green line. The green line is what the prior distribution is. Um, these, these spin combinations um, don't have a, a uniform prior. They, uh, if you had uniformly distributed spins, you end up with these green distributions then for the, these um, combined parameters. And so you can see the uh, the prior distribution in green for each of these parameters, and then in gray, I mean, there's a whole bunch of lines. That's just because we use different waveform models, and this is just to show we kind of got the same answers regardless of which waveform we used. In this case, uh, you see that the um, posterior distribution, which just, just focus on the black with the gray shading, it differs a little from the um, from the prior, 
Uh, in fact, the difference is greater for this chi-effective parameter, which we tend to measure better. Um, so we've learned more about chi-effective than we have about, about chi-precession because chi-p here, because you see that the prior and the posterior distributions here aren't very far apart. Um, so this is a, a way of, of measuring just how much did you learn. So essentially, chi-p is pretty much following the prior distribution, just slightly moved by the data, whereas chi-effective is, is moved a little more and it's, it's favoring a somewhat negative overall chi-effective. So um, that's, that's the... Uh, that's the way to quantify how much we've we've learned about the spins. Now, I didn't actually calculate what the uh, number of bits learnt about the spins was here, um, so uh, but it's not very much. I see a question in the chat, which is, can you say a bit about the prior on the spin? Where does it come from? I don't understand how the posterior from one event can be used for another one, as these events are independent. Right. Okay. So. <clears throat> uh, the, the prior on the spins, uh, this is, you know, this is based on, since we, well, up until recently, hadn't really measured very many systems, uh, the, these um, spin priors, like how, well, we know from general relativity that the dimensionless spin, so this is the spin divided by the mass squared of each body, right? So that that's a number that, um, in magnitude range, ranges from zero to one, these quantities are defined so they can go from uh, negative one to po positive one because uh, at least chi effective is, chi precession goes from zero to one. Um, I'll show you the equations for these later, but <clears throat> uh, so if you were to say, okay, what is the processes that form a binary system? Um, if you, if the stars say went through a common envelope phase, uh, where one of them sort of orbiting inside the other, then that can lead to torques that can align the spins potentially with the orbital angular momentum. So you might expect various processes might line up the spins. If the binaries form from just uh, in a globular cluster with a bunch of mergers, uh, so they just one merger after another, kind of making heavier and heavier black holes then you would expect the spins to be distributed isotropically um, with sort of pretty much any value. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, here our prior is coming from sort of theoretical considerations about how these uh, binaries might have formed. And so we usually take that the spins are uniform um, any, you know, in, in magnitude and in, and in direction. And if you then follow that uh, through and, and see what does that mean for chi effective and chi precession, you end up with these green lines. Now, are those distributions correct? Well, probably not. And then we're supposed to inform them from the observations. And you're saying, well, I don't understand how we can use it from one event. Well, we ne this is now what's known as population inference, right? So we take the collection of 50 odd systems that we've so far detected, and we start looking at the distribution of spins. And this is this prior then is on you know, for a typical member of the population, what does it spin, you know, how's the spin distributed? Um, so it's not the particular values, we're now trying to infer from the population how the spins distributed. So uh, as we get more and more events, we will actually come up with a physical um, probability distribution for spins. And then we would use that as our prior going forward. Um, so it's, it does come from a looking at a population rather than just a single event. But then, you know, for a single event, we think it's drawn from that population. So we'd expect it to lie somewhere, you know, be drawn from that probability distribution. Good. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, we have this quantity, the um, <clears throat> the evidence, and so the probability for a model is given by the prior probability you have that model. So you might, for example, be saying, okay, I have one model which says that spins are uniformly distributed on the sky. Uh, and another one might say that they're always lined up with the orbital angular momentum. So those would be two distinct models. 
and then you can compute the evidence potentially from a whole collection of um, observations now and so the probability just like we had with the individual parameters uh, gets updated you have your prior and then this is the um, evidence or marginal likelihood um, for that model and then you compute for example if I have models I and J I can just calculate the ratio of their probabilities um, which is known as the odds ratio and just inserting the formula from before it's the ratio of the prior odds times the um, ratio of the marginal evidence which is known as the base factor and so uh, we might have had some prior odds between those two models you might have said 50 50 and then you do some observations compute the this base factor and this evidence ratio and you end up saying oh you know what now we're favoring uniform spins you know 10 to 1 over over aligned spins or, or maybe it's the other way around right so this is how through the observations um, and it's really a betting odds it's like a 10 to 1 odds that that's the way the the models are favored so uh, we use this a lot in for example comparing uh, you know, general relativity to various alternative theories. Um, what are the odds that it's one theory versus the other? <clears throat> so that's just the formal mathematics of um, of Bayesian inference. But uh, in practice, it requires doing some high dimensional integrals. In particular, this normalizing factor um, and uh, calculating that normalizing factor, I'll get to this question in the chat in just a second here, uh, calculating this normalizing factor can be very um, expensive. And so one of the techniques uh, originally introduced, I believe in the 50s by Metropolis and then uh, extended by Hastings, allows us to actually calculate the posterior distribution without actually explicitly doing this integral. Um, so that's, that's this technique I'll say a little bit more about, about Markov chain Monte Carlo, and then there's another technique which I personally don't use very much, but is widely used, and that's a, a technique called nested sampling, which I'm not really going to go over because I, uh, I'm going to focus on the one that I mostly use. So Chiara has a question: uh, Can the posterior contradict the prior, or are they coherent by construction? Well, the the posterior um, <clears throat> updates the prior, but there are situations which we keep an eye out for where our prior distribution might extend over a certain range of values. And if we find then after doing an observation that the observation's pushing <clears throat> all of the weight of the distribution up against the boundaries of the prior, then we might wonder if we actually uh, set our prior distribution incorrectly. That's sort of an indicate. I mean, can never actually contradict it because you uh, remember the posterior is given by the product of the prior and the likelihood. So if the if the prior has no support out of a certain range, it's zero outside of a certain range, there's no way the posterior can have support outside of that range. But just one of the things we watch for is if we find that after taking some observations, all of the samples are jammed up against the edge of the prior, then maybe we had our priors wrong. Um, we call that railing against the prior. And we usually take that as a sign that we might've screwed up and we go back and you know uh, try a different prior. <laughs> uh, so I, I like to avoid priors that are that um, overly informative because then you won't learn things. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean I think that uh, you know it's it's like in life where when if someone has extremely uh, rigid beliefs, then no amount of evidence will change their mind. So you have to be careful. Uh, that you don't uh, go in with too rigid a, a prior, otherwise you'll never learn anything. All right, so um, this Markov chain Monte Carlo technique, similar to nested sampling, is really just a it's a it's a, like a sausage grinder. You you have your prior distribution, you supply that, you supply the likelihood, and out comes the uh, posterior, and also you can use the MCMC to calculate evidence and Often it's just making like making sausage. It can be kind of messy, and the internal workings aren't things that you know we always want to get into too much detail about. But I'll say a little bit about the machinery of how 
uh, it, you know, sometimes seems rather magic uh, what goes on inside the, the MCMC machine in, uh, in spitting these samples out. <clears throat> so the, the basic idea is um, you've got some parameter space and if you're at some location, um, some, param some set of parameters X, there is some probability H that you jump from X to Y. So this is a um, transition probability. So you propose a new point. So you pick a new point and that new point is picked by something called the proposal distribution. That's the Q here. In fact, I have these guys uh, labeled up. So we've got the prior, the likelihood and the proposal. So the proposal, if, if we're at location um, X, we propose a jump to a location Y. And this choice of proposals is key to the efficiency of the algorithm, but it, in principle, it shouldn't matter what the proposal is. If you just have some proposal that gets you from any X to any Y, it should work. It just might take a very long time to converge and get you a nice distribution. But you make a, you make a jump, you propose a jump, and then you calculate this ratio. It has to be no larger than one because it's probability, so it's between zero and one. And so this is a transition probability. And then you decide whether to accept that jump or not um, based on this probability. So you just draw another number uniformly between zero and one, and you compare it to this H. Um, and if H is larger than that value, then, uh, <clears throat> then you'll, uh, you'll take the jump. Um, it'll typically accept jumps that go from lower likelihood to higher likelihood. Those, uh, those are usually accepted because often then that leads to a ratio of one, so a probability of one of accepting it. But we can also go downhill. So we can go from regions of high probability and we can actually um, head down. And you can actually prove that just iterating, just repeating this stochastic process of just jumping about, uh, you can prove that this will actually recover then the posterior distribution. So <clears throat> uh, it's just a stochastic exploration with a certain well-defined, well, a well-chosen probability. And you can then easily prove, and I'm not going to go through the proof, but you can prove that it um, then gives you the posterior distribution. Um, here is a, um, a little movie which I stole off the web and I gave the link here where there's various ones. So we've got this two-dimensional probability distribution and uh, here are the marginalized uh, probability distributions and this should run now as a movie. Whenever you see the arrow being green, that jump was accepted. When it's red, it was rejected. So you can see, you know, typically when it tries to jump outside of this sort of banana shape of the probability distribution, it's not accepted. You'll also see that it's sometimes, um, you know, rejected even when it jumps uh, to somewhere that is in the banana, but that's because the probability wasn't one, so there's still some chance you reject it. And if you just keep on doing this, it'll just fill out and over time it will recover um, by this stochastic sampling, it will recover the distributions. So it's a um, uh, the gray arrow. Uh, well, they're gray. The gray is when it's first proposed and then they color it green or red depending on whether it's accepted. Does that make sense? So they're just showing you where it's proposing to jump and then after that decision's been made, uh, it's either green or red. Green if it was accepted, red if it wasn't. Um, and apologies if you're uh, colorblind because then it wouldn't actually look any different, but um, I didn't make the animation. But this, this, uh, this link here gives you a link to a bunch of uh, different kinds of MCMCs and how they perform. So uh, worth, worth looking at. So I actually have my own recipe that I follow mostly, um, sort of developed over quite a few years. Uh, so there's a little recipe card. So I have my ingredients and directions. Um, I use, I like to use what's known as local approximations to the posterior, which actually is a, a Taylor expansion, basically, um, using the Fisher information matrix. Um, it's good to use global maps to kind of map out the overall structure of the likelihood to help you find uh, secondary, uh, secondary maxima. 
Um, I use something called differential evolution, which I'll describe. It's very simple. And another key ingredient is something called parallel tempering, which I'll also describe. And basically, we just mix all of these proposals together. These are all just different ways of jumping. So I don't stick to one form of jumping. I use a whole collection of different types of jumps. And then uh, <clears throat> you can do various checks to make sure that your um, MCMC is, is valid. Uh, if you, for example, set the likelihood to a constant, which means you don't learn anything, then when you run the MCMC, it should recover the prior distribution. Um, so that's always a good check to make sure that you've not screwed something up in the coding. Um, because if the likelihood's flat, the likelihood's not containing any information, so the MCMC should just recover the prior, right? Because there was no, nothing to be learnt because the prior, sorry, the likelihood was uninformative. Um, another thing, and I, uh, I don't think I've got an example of that today, is uh, so-called um, PP plots, that's probability, probability plots. So uh, what you would want to see if you do a bunch of simulations, so you simulate, um, say, a bunch of data and put in signals, you know what the parameters of those systems were because you, you simulated it. And then when you run your analysis on those simulated signals, you hope to find that the um, true value, say, of the mass is always, you know, it 10% of the time it's in the 10% probability contour, you know, 20% of the time it's in the 20%. So it's just a consistency check to make sure that the probability quantiles you're getting actually, um, you're finding, and it's sort of like a frequentist test of a Bayesian analysis that if you just repeat it over and over in simulated analyses, that you actually do find things lying in the correct uh, probability um, quantile the, the right fraction of the time. And what we're looking for as we run these MCMCs is we want to reach um, stationarity. That means that we've like fully sampled everything and nothing's changing. Uh, so this is the, the sort of the recipe that we use. And I'll just go through some of the, um, the proposals. So for example, for the local approximation, um, the Fisher information matrix is the Hessian of second derivatives of the log of the prior times the um, likelihood. So it forms up a Gaussian, just a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And locally, it should actually follow the contours of the probability distribution. So um, it's a local, uh, yeah, it's a local approximation to the, to the posterior. And so it, it provides usually a very good probability distribution to draw from, draw the jumps from, and jumping from X to Y. So that's something that we typically use in, in uh, our analyses. Uh, another, um, well, as I mentioned yesterday, a lot, of, a lot of times the likelihood surfaces are multimodal. So, and also very often we're trying to search for signals in a very high dimensional space. And Markov chains aren't particularly efficient at moving around large dimensional spaces. You've got to find the, the, the peaks of the hills. And so you can use um, various techniques to try and make a, a crude global map of, the, of, of good regions to look at. And then uh, that can help guide um, the analysis. And so it helps you find the different peaks um, another, and or here's an example actually from uh, uh, Bayes Wave. What you're looking at here are time frequency maps of a um, of a binary black hole signal. So you got time across the uh, horizontal axis, frequency vertical, color coded by the the power, and these are done at different um, wavelet resolutions. So the Q here is the number of cycles in the wavelet. These are Gaussian enveloped sinusoids. I'll show a picture of one of those later. And the Q sets how many oscillations there are within the Gaussian envelope, so the decay rate of that envelope. And you see that at different Qs, you resolve the signal differently. So what we do is we transform the data at each of these different Qs. And then this now forms a proposal, because clearly, if you're going to drop down um, a wavelet to try and match this signal, 
it makes a lot more sense to drop it down where there's like an excess of power than just dropping it down sort of randomly in the time frequency plane. So this becomes, so we tend to propose um, to put uh, wavelets down where there's excess power. Um, the code then actually doesn't just fit them in power, it fits them in amplitude and phase. So it's a fully coherent search, but as far as like where should we go and look for the signal, we might as well look where there's an excess of power. <clears throat> um, differential evolution is, is a very effective technique. What you do is you collect, as, as your Markov chain jumps around, you just collect a, a history of the past samples, and then you pick two past samples, um, say R1, X subscript R1 here, and X subscript R2, and that defines a direction in parameter space, and often these parameter spaces are very high dimensional, and then you propose a jump from the current location um, either positive or negative along this direction, scaled by some amount. So the nice thing that this does is if, if you have parameters that are correlated in a particular direction in parameter space, this tends to take jumps you know, along that uh, direction where there's maybe a parameter degeneracy. So it's very effective at exploring these highly correlated parameters. And it's also useful for doing these mode jumps. If you've got a collection of probability like a hill here and a hill over here, it'll actually allow you occasionally to jump from one hill to the other, which is something that otherwise um, Markov chains aren't very good at uh, fully exploring a space. So differential evolution is another key ingredient we use. And then another ingredient that we use for a couple of reasons is called parallel tempering. Um, it's also called uh, repli replica exchange. And the idea is, and here's just a, a two-dimensional example. So in red, I've just shown a, a you know, sketched out a possible, um, this is just a pair of Gaussians, um, likelihood surface. We've got a primary mode. So we've got a peak here, and then we've got a second mode over here. And we'd like to explore both of those. The problem is the, uh, the Markov chain, if it gets up here on, say, the primary mode, or if it's stuck over on the secondary mode, while you can walk down the, the likelihood surface, it really struggles to cross this low probability region and get across to the next uh, hill. So uh, one of the things we do is uh, we raise the likelihood to the power 1 over t, where t is like an effective temperature. So as t goes to infinity, this goes to a constant. And so here I've shown it at t equals 1 and t equals 10, and you see the t equals 10 surface is much flatter. So it's much easier to go from this mode to this mode for these so-called hot chains, the ones that are exploring the high temperature surface. And we couple all these together so they can exchange information. They actually swap parameters. Um, so if a hot chain finds its way from the secondary mode over to the primary mode, it will transfer that information down the ladder. So we have a, a, a spaced ladder of different temperatures. We'll have often dozens or even up to you know, hundreds of different temperatures, all, all just spaced um, by some amount. Uh, and this, this allows us to explore much more complicated surfaces. And I'll show you an example of this in a moment. Um, another uh, key use of having all of these different chains at different um, temperatures is that if you take the average of the likelihood at a given temperature, and beta here is the inverse temperature, 1 over t, and you integrate, um, or in, in, in practice, it's a sum because you just have a discrete collection of these inverse temperatures, if you sum up the average um, log likelihood at uh, each temperature, it gives you the log of the evidence. So we use this to calculate the evidence, um, the model evidence, and we use that for, then for uh, model comparison. So parallel tempering not only helps you explore the whole space, it also gives you a very uh, nice way of calculating the, the evidence, the model evidence. Here's an example. So this is a, um, it kind of looks like a fractal, but that's because it's nature. This is actually some mountains near me uh, in Montana. Uh, and 
This is just a regular um, Markov chain Monte Carlo that's just doing a little, uh, little tiny Gaussian jumps each time. This is the highest mountain in this particular map here. So the blue are the valleys and the red is the, the mountain peaks. Um, and this happens to be the highest peak over here. Um, this is actually in the Beartooth mountain range, um, which as its name suggests has a lot of grizzly bears. Uh, so you gotta be careful when you're camping there. But anyway, I'll just play this one more time. Uh, let's go back. Um, and you see that it starts off, I started this off, and this is this collection of dots is um, showing you the last, say, 20 places that the chain was. Uh, so I'm just showing 20 dots of the last 20, 20 locations explored. And you see as it, as it starts running, it sort of walks along and it's good at finding the, you know, the nearest mountain range and climbing up. But then it just sort of, once it gets to the top of this mountain range, it just sort of stays there. Uh, and you could let this run for a long time. It might eventually walk all the way down the valley and up to the next mountain range, but it's not mapping out the entire you know, space. In the uh, next uh, animation, the white dots are the high temperature chains and the black dots are the low temperature chains. I'm not showing the ones in between, but you see that the black dots very quickly have locked onto this um, the highest peak over here, it's called Electric Peak. Um, and uh, the, uh, yeah, so the white dots are just jumping all over the place and there's other ones. And you see that the, the black dots, which are the cold chain where you actually collect your samples, it's moving all over the place and, and, and very quickly finding the highest peaks um, in this distribution. So parallel tempering is really key to exploring a space um, fully. All right, um, a slight change of pace just for a moment. Um, we've been talking about how do we uh, just the uh, how do we explore the parameter spaces, but uh, part of what's going on there, it's you know these gravitational wave signals, and if we have um, you know a waveform model, which is say a combination of maybe a post-Newtonian description for the early in spiral, maybe some effective one body type description for the um, as we get closer to merger, and then as we get up to merger, looking at say numerical relativity or other ideas such as the uh, um, Sean McWilliams's new idea, this uh, backward one, one body model, where you actually start with the final black hole and kind of work backwards using perturbation theory. Um, the information about the system is encoded in the waveform and it depends as you know on the masses and the spins in different ways and so for the early um, in spiral phase which um, so we've got generically in the frequency domain i can represent the signal as some amplitude as a function of frequency in a phase and the l's here are the different harmonics um, and for the dom dominant harmonic you have this like post newtonian expansion where you get um, where u here is basically the orbital velocity, right? So this is the, the usual sort of expression for a uh, <clears throat> post-Newtonian expansion. And here's sort of like some of the leading order terms in that expansion. So dominantly, what you're encoding in the early in spiral is information about the chirp mass. And uh, when you get to the merger and ring down, the merger and ring down depend on the final mass and the final spin of the system. So when you put all that together, you've got you know, different stages in the wave, in the waveform are encoding different information. And this is what we're exploring as we try out these different waveforms and compare them to the data. We're putting in different values of the mass, different values of the spin, calculating ourselves the, the likelihood. And, uh, and then we sort of jump around either with a nested sampling or a or a Markov chain Monte Carlo to explore that um, collection of parameters. So in the post-Newtonian, um, the lowest order post-Newtonian is encodes, it just depends on this uh, U parameter here, or, which is roughly the velocity. So that's encoding the chirp mass. Um, 
At 1pn order, you get eta, which is the uh, symmetric mass ratio, so mass 1 times mass 2 divided by the, the total mass squared. So that now gets you combined with the chirp mass, that's now getting you the individual masses. And then at uh, 1.5pn order, you get a combination of the spins getting measured. At 2pn order, there's different combinations of the spins showing up. Um, so between the 1.5pn and 2pn, you can then measure both of the spins. You see that different combinations are appearing at different orders, and uh, this is the dominant term, so we measure the chirp mass best. Uh, the individual masses are the next best me measured combination, especially when we combine that with, as I'll mention in a moment, the, uh, the final merger. The spins, because they're, they, they come in at higher order, they're not as um, significant effect on the waveforms, so measuring the spins is more challenging. <clears throat> and we see that uh, here, here's some examples from some of the early LIGO observations. So here the first, uh, the first collection of black holes um, that we measured. And you'll see, so we focused our attention here on GW170104, so they've colored up the two-dimensional um, posterior distribution in, in mass one and mass two here. And here are the one-dimensional marginalized distributions for that. And you see, as we kind of go up in mass, the shapes, um, the shapes change. Uh, for the more massive systems, we actually mostly are measuring the total mass, which comes from the final merger and ring down. Whereas for the lower mass systems, these ones here, we get these characteristic banana shapes, which actually lie along lines of constant chirp mass. So the chirp mass, which is this direction here in the banana, is very well defined, very, very well measured, whereas the uh, total mass, which is kind of in the orthogonal direction, is not so well measured. So as you go up in mass, uh, for the low mass ones, we're seeing most of the early in spiral, which measures the chirp mass, whereas for the high mass ones, because of the shape of the LIGO sensitivity, LIGO Virgo sensitivity curves, we mostly see just the merger, so we, we measure best the uh, total mass. And you'll see that with most of the LIGO, um, if you looked at the entire collection, we have some nice plots with uh, showing many, many systems, and you see this characteristic uh, distinction that the more high mass systems have their total mass measured well, whereas the low mass systems have their chirp mass measured well. Uh, with the spins, um, here is a, it's, these, uh, these plots show magnitude out in the radial direction and then angle relative to the uh, orbital angular momentum is then the shaded coloring. So, uh, sorry, it's, it's in the, uh, the polar direction here. So this is the tilt goes around this way and magnitude along the radial direction. And you see that, you know, it's a pretty broad distribution. We, we haven't really pinned down the, either the magnitude or the direction that well, except it's definitely favoring tilts that are down in the, in this lower, and this is for the, uh, the primary mass, and this is for the spin of the, the secondary mass, the lower mass companion. Uh, for the primary mass, we actually have measured the spin, at least narrowed it down, that says the tilt's probably closer to, you know, 130 degrees, and the magnitude somewhere around about half of maximal, but it's a pretty broad distribution. And then for the lower mass system, we haven't really measured the spin hardly at all. It's pretty much covering the, the whole possible range here. Um, and the prior in this, um, in this kind of representation would just be uniform color across this disk because it would be uniform in magnitude and uniform in direction, basically. Um, Okay, here's a question from Chiara. In the case of a perfectly degenerate distribution of parameters, would the MCMC -MC converge? Uh, the answer is yes, but only if you... Um, uh, it definitely can pose a challenge to the algorithms. Um, and if you don't have a, a good MCMC uh, -MC algorithm, it might it might struggle to converge, but yes, in principle, it will converge. And if you use some of the techniques that I was mentioning, such as the uh, uh, differential evolution is very good at 
following those highly, like even like perfectly degenerate. I mean, what you'll find then, right, is there is going to be some combination of parameters that's completely undetermined, right? So you'll get a just a, a uniform distribution in some combination that's not determined. And if your MCMC is um, uh, has a good mix of proposals, especially differential evolution, it will find that um, that degenerate combination and uh, it will be able to map out these extreme degeneracies. So it, in principle, it, it poses no problem. Uh, in practice, it does challenge algorithms uh, and systems that are highly, you know, highly degenerate can be quite difficult to, you know, collect independent samples on, but there's nothing in principle that says you can't do it. It will work in principle. Whereas, for example, if I used a Fisher information matrix, it would just have a, a zero then in one of its one of its eigenvalues would be zero and the matrix would be singular. Um, and so in principle, the, the Fisher matrix would no longer have an inverse. Um, there are ways around that using uh, singular value decompositions and things. Uh, but in principle, the Fisher matrix becomes undefined, whereas the MCMC is still well defined. So that's one of the reasons that we prefer to do the fully Bayesian analysis if, if we can. Here's an example. Um, this is GW170817, which was the binary, the first binary neutron star. Um, <clears throat> and we have two different posterior distributions here. One where we changed the prior on the spins that said that the magnitude of the spins was less than 0.05, which is kind of what we expect theoretically more for these kinds of um, binary neutron stars. And then there was another one where we just restricted the spins to be less than about 0.89. That restriction, rather than being just less than one, was because of the waveforms we were using not really being valid for spins above about 0.9. And you see that uh, we have this very strong degeneracy, and this is following a line of total chirp mass. So when you're trying to measure the individual masses in this system, M1 and M2, which are sort of you know coming in at neutron star kind of masses, um, because of this, because we're mostly getting the information in this system, well, we essentially entirely getting the information for GW170817 just from the uh, in spiral, uh, we have this huge degeneracy. So we don't measure the individual masses very well, but we do measure the chirp mass really well. Um, but physically, what we'd like to know with the individual masses, is this really a pair of neutron stars or was it maybe a neutron star in a black hole? You can see that when we restrict the spins using a prior that goes um, more like what we'd expect for a pair of um, uh, binary neutron stars, uh, as far as their spins go, you then see the masses actually then uh, get restricted to a region that's much more in keeping with what you would expect for a, a neutron star, around 1.3, 1.5 solar masses. So that's, that's an example, Chiara, of not a perfect degeneracy, but an awfully tight degeneracy. And so um, it also hurt, helps to parameterize your uh, waveforms using, say, chirp mass and total mass rather than using mass one and mass two. Because if you use chirp mass, um, then one of the directions that you're heading along is the chirp mass direction. If you parameterize your waveforms in terms of mass one and mass two, it's harder because most of that space is empty. Um, so sometimes just parameterizing your waveform in a uh, using an appropriate set of variables is is uh, helps the MCMC uh, converge more quickly than if you used, um, say, mass one and mass two. <clears throat> As I was mentioning earlier, the, uh, the the spins of these systems are generally not very well measured. In part, that's because it comes in at um, higher post you know post-Newtonian order. Um, here is from just, and I could have updated the plots to also include all of the systems from the second gravitational wave transient catalog. So this was gravitational wave transient catalog one. Um, and here is the chi effective parameter and this chi precession parameter, which I think I'm about to define on the next slide. <clears throat> and you see that and these are so-called violin plots. It's where you actually show the, um, 
the marginalized distributions, uh, it's like stacking together a whole bunch of histograms. Um, and you see that typically for most of these systems, the, the spin, the chi effective parameter is pretty much consistent with zero, except for this one, uh, this one system out here, GW170729, I think. Uh, there's some evidence that there was non-zero spin. And if you then look at the um, precession combination, the, the combination of the spins that really tells us most about the possibility that the spins and the angular momentum, orbital angular momentum are misaligned, which will then lead to uh, orbital precession and uh, modulation of the waveform, you see, and these, the prior on this runs from zero to one. Again, it's not a uniform prior, but you see that for all of these systems, pretty much, we were getting results for the precession parameter, which are consistent with the, um, with just the prior distribution. So we weren't really learning anything about the precession. Now, if I had updated this slide, which I apologize for not doing, and showed um, also the results from Gravitational Wave Transient Catalog 2, we do now have some systems where there's evidence for precession and strong evidence for non-zero spins. So as we've added to the number of black holes that we've measured, um, we're now starting to see a few systems at least where the spin is uh, definitely not zero and also showing some indications of precession. <clears throat> so why is measuring black hole spins so hard? We can measure the mass as well, but why not the spins? Well, <clears throat> here's some waveforms, and uh, the, the top waveform, you can't really see the little oscillations, you're just seeing really the envelope here. The top waveform is a non-spinning black hole uh, viewed face on. And then the next one down is a, for a spinning black hole uh, where we're observing it aligned with the total angular momentum direction. So the total angular momentum direction is the sum of the... Um, the orbital angular momentum and the individual spin angular momentum. Then these later plots are exactly the same system as what we just looked at here, the spinning black hole, but now viewed at different angles. So if we view it um, inclined by uh, pi on six, you now start seeing the, the modulation because what we're in this first one, we're, we're observing the system face on. So it's orbiting <clears throat> Uh, the orbital plane's orthogonal to the direction that we are viewing it at. And what's happening, if you viewed it edge on, which is what this bottom plot shows, you would actually see, when you view it edge on, you actually see that the orbital plane is tilting around because of spin-orbit coupling. But when you view, you know, think about looking at a wobbling plate, uh, if you're viewing it face on, you can't really tell that it's wobbling because it still just looks like a circle. When you view it edge on, you can see that it's, you know, you can much more easy to see the wobble. So as you increase this, um, this observing angle from zero, you can start to see the uh, modulation. And the modulation is happening, of course, because gravitational waves are primarily emitted orthogonal to the orbital plane. And so, <clears throat> You know, as the system tilts towards us, it gets louder, and then as it tilts away from us, it gets quieter, right? So you're getting this um, uh, this modulation as the orbital um, orientation. But if you happen to view the system uh, with zero inclination, then you're just not going to be able to tell the difference, at least from the modulation between a spinning black hole and a non-spinning black hole. Here are the definitions of these um, combinations. And uh, the chi effective is the product of mass one times the dimensionless um, spin of the system, of that of, of, of uh, body one. And then there's the cosine of the uh, angle between the orbital angular momentum and the spin and that first spin. And then plus the, uh, the mass two times the dimensionless spin of, of the second body again, times the cosine of the angle between the uh, orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum of that body. And so this mostly measures, because of those cosines, it measures the component 
that's either aligned or anti-aligned with the with the angular momentum. So this goes, you know, these these numbers go between minus one and and one. So it's mostly measuring the aligned or anti-aligned component of the spin, the, pa the part of the spin that's either aligned with the angular momentum or anti-aligned with the angular momentum direction or the angular momentum. And then the chi p, which is the combination that tells you about precession, mostly measures the orthogonal components. Um, and this parameter is defined here. So this is this is the in-plane uh, spin combination. <clears throat> so the problem is, if you view a system face on, you it's really hard to tell that it's spinning. And there's a selection effect. The signal to noise scales as the chirp mass to the 5 thirds power divided by the uh, distance squared into this combination of the inclinations. And so you see this is maximized for inclinations of zero, so a face-on system. So this tells you when we're looking out at a population of sources, well, for obviously, if the luminosity distance is small, then it's going to be louder. So we're more sensitive to nearby sources. That's hardly surprising. We're more sensitive to high mass systems. It goes as the chirp mass to the 5 thirds power. Again, not very surprising. These are gravitational waves and the charge is mass, right? So the more mass, the, the louder the signal. And then because of this um, a quadrupole, dominantly quadrupolar antenna pattern of the emission, we are most sensitive to systems that are either um, at uh, zero or pi for their inclination. Uh, in which case these cosine squareds and cosines to the fourth go to one, right? So we have a selection effect that says we're much more likely to see um, face-on or face-off systems. And that then means we can't see the precession very well because for a face-on or a face-off system, the precession, um, the wobble isn't obvious. So uh, that's one of the reasons why so far we've struggled to find systems just because of the selection effects um, and it wasn't until we got to the second catalog that we started really seeing uh, the first systems with definite signs of precession. I think I might... Um... Yeah, so I'm just going to take a break to chat with you guys for a little bit, and then I'm going to move on to some more uh, sort of advanced techniques, in particular uh, this trans-dimensional inference, um, which we use in LISA data analysis, and we also use it but say detecting unknown signals in the LIGO Virgo detectors and also for modeling the noise and noise transients and the overall power spectra. So I'm going to get onto some more advanced techniques um, in a moment, but let's just stop. And I've had a few questions in the chat as we went along, but uh, take a couple of questions and then take a little bit of a break and then come back uh, for the final advanced topics. Yeah, yeah. Don't be shy. Go <laughs> ask questions. Hey, so I have a, a question, which is just related to sort of inference in general as used in uh, gravitational wave cosmology. So um, there's been a lot of recent work on likelihood free inference. And right. I was wondering if you could just, you know, give your thoughts on that and how that <clears throat> can be or if it is being applied in gravitational waves. Yeah, I've seen a little bit of on that. I mean, I think the term likelihood free is maybe uh, a little misleading. Um, <clears throat> you, you can't really do inference without a likelihood, right? The likelihood is how you learn about, um, that's how you incorporate new information. Uh, from what I've read of some of these um, techniques, especially those using various machine learning, is that um, it's just it's really more efficient ways to calculate the likelihood um, where you can kind of learn um, you can learn the shape of the likelihood surface from a sort of a sparse sampling effectively. And it's a form. It's a very clever form of interpolation, if I understand it correctly. But you know, there is no way to do Bayesian inference without a likelihood, because without a likelihood, you don't. That's how you take in new information. So, from what I've read, and I haven't read a whole lot of papers on this, but I've have read a couple. Um, 
what I saw it coming down to was just very clever ways of essentially uh, doing a effectively an interpolation from a sparse sampling of the likelihood, which mass massively speeds speed things up. Maybe I've you know may, maybe I've not understood these papers or maybe I've missed some, but I just don't see from a fundamental perspective it's not really possible to do inference without a likelihood. The likelihood is how you take in information from the data. So without a likelihood, you know, you don't learn anything. So yeah, from what I've read, it's a, it's a clever interpolation technique. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, that's, that's completely right. It's just um, like you, you obviously cannot do inference without a likelihood function. I think the likelihood free uh, nomenclature comes from like in, in instances where the likelihood is not explicitly calculable right. or easy to calculate. Yeah. So they find other ways to do it. Yeah, it's using like a bit of a proxy that's not the, yeah. And, you know, the likelihood function, I've, I've written down very def definitive ones here, right? It's our noise model. Um, but the, uh, in some instances, it's just sort of very, well, even, even in gravitational wave analysis, we don't really know what the noise is, right? So we actually, in the more advanced techniques, some of which I'm going to speak about uh, shortly, we're jointly inferring the noise properties, which actually means that the likelihood now isn't fixed, right? It it is. Um, it gets into this world of Bayesian hyperparametrics where we um, are inferring the likelihood function at the same time as using the likelihood function. Um, but what you're talking about is even like a step beyond that, where it's not even necessarily possible to write down a parametric form for the likelihood, and so it's a it's a sort of a a fuzzier version of inference. Then, hmm. oh, that's interesting. Looking forward to that. Any other question? Please uh, raise your hand uh, or use the chat if you have one. So, <clears throat> hi. Maybe I have uh, a more a much more naive one. So, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Hear okay. okay. First of all, thanks for this uh, very 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 nice uh, very nice lecture. So yesterday, you mentioned at some point when you when there was this unified uh, uh, approach to all uh, different uh, gravitational wave experiments. Basically, the difference that you, you said at some point, tell me if I understood correctly, that LIGO and Virgo have a, will have a vast amount of data for rare signals, while LISA have a much smaller set of data for, mm -hmm. uh, for a million of overlapping sources. So my naive and generic question, if, uh, well, uh, let's say advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo will be in uh, between these two. Yes. Sort of yeah, and, uh, and for instance, yeah, if, if advanced light and advanced Virgo will have some hope to, to detect, for instance, the stoch stochastic background, in your opinion. Okay, so that's... Yes. Um, so for both of those, as, as the ground-based detectors increase in sensitivity, especially at low frequencies, and this may not happen with advanced LIGO and advanced Virgo, this might be more what we call third-generation detectors, like the Einstein telescope, and the uh, Cosmic Explorer, which is some of the sort of next generation detectors. Um, in those cases, the something like a neutron star signal will actually enter the sensitive band um, many hours before merger. And so, and then we know that the rate of neutron star mergers in the universe and the rate of binary black hole mergers is, you know, they're happening every sort of 10 minutes or so, forget the exact numbers. We have some error bars on that. But that means that those detectors will have multiple signals, um, detectable signals, uh, in their sensitive band at the same time. So the ground-based detectors become increasingly like the LISA case uh, as, they, as they improve in sensitivity. So we will have to deal with multiple signals simultaneously in the data. And we'll also have to deal with the modulation caused by the movement of the Earth. The fact that the Earth is spinning, going around the sun, means that the antenna patterns, orientation with respect to the sky is changing, which is very similar to what's happening with LISA. So yes, the ground-based detectors, as we go forward, start looking more and more like LISA in terms of their data analysis. And so the fact is, the fact that we're already doing all this preparation for LISA is great, because uh, it also prepares us for the next generation of of ground-based detectors. And your other question about um, detecting uh, a stochastic background, well, we know 
we now have a pretty good handle on the rate of black hole and neutron star mergers in the universe. And we can then run that out to uh, extrapolate that out to higher redshifts. It means there's many signals, individual signals that we're not detecting. Um, there's too, too quiet to uh, be individually resolvable but there's a whole pile of them and they pile up to form an effective stochastic background. Um, and uh, we've calculated that uh, for LIGO and Virgo. And if the, you know, if the current detectors continue improving as we expect, we should be able to detect the, so this stochastic component, the unresolved component uh, during the next observation run. So O4, um, should actually detect that stochastic background from the astrophysical population that we're not individually resolving. So that that's on the that that should happen in the near, near term. Okay. Now, more excitingly, you know, can we detect um, some kind of a stochastic signal that comes from maybe the early universe? Yeah, um, would that be my my next question? Indeed. Okay. Well, there's you know significant uncertainties on on what the level that might come from, right? Like, is it from cosmic strings? Is it from some sort of phase transitions associated with different processes in the early universe? You know, how is that level going to, you know, just how loud might that signal be? Is it even there? Um, you know, one of the problems is with the ground-based detectors is we know for sure there's going to be a background from the unresolved uh, black holes and neutron star mergers. And so can we, separate that from a you know a signal from the early universe well one of the things is we predict fairly well that spectrum of that um that astrophysical component so if we see something in the data that has a very different spectrum so you can actually predict for a circular binaries um, evolving just under gravitational wave emission you're going to get this characteristic f to the minus two-thirds spectrum for the for that um, for that signal, and you would get a different spectrum if it was say from, you know, some early universe process. So potentially we we do have some ways to tell them apart, but um, it's going to be challenging. And the same goes with Lisa. Um, we may may we may well detect a cosmological stochastic signal, but the problem is we will probably be fighting against you know, stochastic signals from the unresolved extreme mass ratio in spirals, for example. And again, we'll have to try and separate it based on their different spectra. Thank you. So, uh, any break. more questions? Oh, yeah. Other questions? Yes. And then we could maybe take a little break. Um, I would have a, um, a question again in the direction of the, uh, the, gen the generate parameters. Um, because the, the example you showed, so uh, it is pretty neat in the sense that you say, okay, we have a degenerate scene and one and two, mm -hmm. uh, but we see that if we build a combination of these parameters, which is the chirp mass and the total mass, uh, and this we can measure well. And it so happens that the chirp mass and the total mass, they make sense physically. Right. But sometimes uh, there is a case in which uh, uh, you are interested in two physical parameters and actually they are degenerate and what is not degenerate is some combination of them that apparently makes no sense. Right. So yeah, and in this case, are you stuck or is there? Yeah, I mean, there's fundamentally nothing you can do at that point, right? I mean, it really, if they are truly a degenerate, uh, you get, like you say, you get um, constraints on a particular combination of them, but you don't get constraints on the individual parameters. But I mean, what you could do in that case is you could take your theoretical, um, you, know, you, know, might, you might have a different, you might have a particular theoretical model, right? And it predicts values for the individual parameters. Well, instead of using those, you then have to combine them to form that same combination that's actually measured. And you just end up constraining that combination. Now, it might not be everything you want to do, uh, but it's you know, that's going to be the, you just have to take your, your theory and uh, map it over to that combination of parameters. And, and that's all you're going to get, I'm afraid, uh, unless you can think of then a new experiment, right, that comes in from a orthogonal direction and is able to resolve those parameters. So sometimes, um, 
And that's quite often when we do multi-messenger type observations, you know, we measure some things well in gravitational waves and we maybe measure other things well electromagnetically. So sometimes if we can do joint observations, they can break some of these degeneracies for us. Um, you certainly see that in cosmology, right? There are uh, C and B measurements measure various combinations of the, uh, you know, Hubble expansion rate and density parameters, and those cut, I mean, these aren't 100% degeneracies, right? But then there's uh, measurements of, say, supernova luminosities give you a different, um, the error ellipses sort of line a somewhat different direction for these this other method of measurement, and then the two give you a nice bullseye on the parameters. So often combining observations from different, you know, different kinds of observations can often uh, help break these degeneracies. But if we just have to rely on one messenger, uh, sometimes we're stuck with um, poorly constrained combinations. And yeah, there's nothing you can really do about it. It's just the way the nature is. And so then you have to find another way to make a measurement. Um, any more question? If not, perhaps it would be a good time for the break you were talking about. Neil, what do you yep. think? Okay, yeah, let's take a break. Uh, so five minutes or something like that? Yeah, let's re resume at 20 after the hour, whichever hour you happen to be on. Perfect. All right. See you back in a moment. Yes, see you back. All right. So... Uh, what I'm going to get onto now in the final portion of the uh, the lecture is getting into some of the more advanced techniques that are being developed. And uh, as I mentioned already, the challenges, especially as we move on to things like LISA data analysis, but also analysis for the next generation of ground-based detectors, uh, certainly for uh, pulsar timing analyses, we're already using some of these techniques. We have these issues of not knowing how many signals are going to be resolvable and we don't know what their parameters are uh, so that brings us into this idea of trans-dimensional inference where we explore both the model dimension and the parameters of the model so uh, I'll say a little bit how this is done and basically what we do is we let the the data inform us about the complexity of the model and <clears throat> so we make the model dimension a parameter and so we explore both the uh, say the number of signals or if the case of like modeling bursts, you know, how many wavelets does it take to capture a burst? And then for when we're modeling the, the noise spectra, how complicated does our model have to be? How many components should it have? We make that a parameter so we don't um, over specify in advance the model. Um, so I have a very simple example of this. Um, so here is just some simulated data with 32 data points, and I'm going to fit an order D polynomial to the data. So let's start with a, um, well, first of all, we've got the chi-squared. Remember, this is what uh, Gauss taught us. We've got the data, the data points minus the model squared divided by the uncertainty, uh, the, the, the uh, measurement uncertainty, in each of the data points and you sum that up and that's your chi-squared right that's your goodness of fit which is then related to the log of the likelihood <clears throat> so if i took a polynomial with uh degree 32 and fit it to the data this is what i get well i get a perfect fit i get chi-squared of zero but clearly we're overfitting the data here um you can get you know a if i have a if I have 32 data points and a and a 32 dimensional polynomial, yes, I can run it th exactly through every one of those data points, but clearly you can see these big oscillations and that sort of thing. We're clearly overfitting the data here. So if I step down a bit and use say a degree 24 polynomial, this is the the maximum likelihood solution for a, uh, a dimension 24 polynomial. Again, we're still sort of overfitting the data here. If we step that down to 16, that's looking pretty good, um, fitting the data pretty well. It turns out we're still overfitting it. And I'll step down to eight, uh, degree eight polynomial. Now we're getting a nice fit. 
If we go all the way down to say a degree four polynomial, well, maybe we've gone a little bit too simple now because uh, we're missing, we're not going through all the data points very well anymore. So if we go down, you see the chi-squared has got very large because uh, we're missing quite a lot of those data points. So a degree four polynomial is really too, too simple a model, whereas a degree you know, 32 polynomial was way too complicated. So how do we um, figure out which dimension to use in the case of um, classical statistics, you would use what's known as the reduced chi-squared, um, which is sort of a trade-off between dimension of the model and the chi-squared. And that's naturally um, done when we use Bayesian uh, model selection. So here is from a simulation where I uh, ran a what's known as a trans-dimensional Markov chain Monte Carlo where I allow the dimension of the um, the dimension of the model to vary along with the parameters of the model. So the parameters would be, you know, the coefficients um, in front of each term in this polynomial. So I I explore the coefficients of each at each dimension, and this histogram here actually shows the occupancy um, of each model. So it really preferred uh, a seven-dimensional uh, polynomial, a, a degree seven polynomial. There was some support, this is a log scale here, uh, there was some support for a degree eight polynomial, degree nine, and degree ten. It really didn't have any support for dimensions above ten, and it really didn't have support for any dimensions below seven. Uh, so here are just some examples. These lines are just showing a few draws from the analysis here where it was trying out different degree polynomials with somewhat different parameters. We kind of get this band then of possible um, models. So we allow the, the model dimension and the parameters to vary simultaneously and it finds the correct model. And what it's really doing here, uh, these the ratio of the height, say, of the degree seven polynomial to the degree eight polynomial, this is actually the evidence ratio for those. So this is the Bayesian, the Bayesian evidence between seven and eight is just given between the uh, the height of these. And remember, this is on a log scale. So the in fact, the dimension seven is favored by a factor of about a hundred over dimension eight, and dimension seven is favored by um, a factor of about ten thousand over dimension nine. So this is the this also gives us the evidence for these different models. So it really, in this case, really preferred a dimension seven model. So these are uh, techniques that we use now in a lot of a lot of our analyses, and in particular, uh, the Bayes wave analysis in LIGO Virgo is we have a trans-dimensional model that also has multiple parts to it. We have a model for the signal, a model for noise transients, which we call glitches, and then we also have a model for the Gaussian noise, and we explore this uh, model with a a trans-dimensional Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, and the dimension is quite large of the model. We have uh, um, the model dimensions in the thousands, and so we we move around in this high-dimensional model model space. The the that's where the the Bayes in the in the title comes from because we're using Bayesian model selection. The wave part comes from using a wavelet decomposition. So we actually uh, model the signals and the glitches using a collection of, of wavelets and uh, the number of wavelets is a free parameter. We can have 0, 1, 10, you know, uh, any number of wavelets up to some, I guess, some maximum. And then the parameters of the wavelets, uh, their, their frequency, the central frequency, so that's basically a sine wave which has a certain frequency and there's a Gaussian envelope and that, uh, that envelope, how many cycles we have is given by the quality factor and where these are located in time, because these are centered somewhere in time and frequency, those are all parameters that we, we explore. <clears throat> so one of the other components that we need to model is the, uh, is the noise spectrum. These are actual examples of the uh, power spectra in actually early, this is even, this is uh, S6, so this is not even advanced LIGO, uh, even though they look kind of similar these days we've got these, all of these different lines which come from various <clears throat> um, things like the suspension of the 
um, the masses. We've also got lines that come in from the, the power supplies and uh, various other sources. And so we need to model this power spectrum in some way. So we do that. We, we use, in the case of Bayes wave, a smooth component, which we fit with a cubic spline. And we also have um, line components, which are Lorentzians or Cauchy distributions, which is actually what you expect for a, um, a, reson a resonance uh, that's polluted by noise. Um, this cubic spline, the number of control points is a free parameter. So we don't actually specify the spacing of the control points. We, we allow the code to explore how many control points there should be for the spline, how many knots for the spline, and then of course the height of each of those um, control points. So just to say, yeah, sorry, um, we also have these transients. I mentioned these, these glitches, these noise transients in the data. Um, so these are localized excesses in, um, of power. Uh, they, they make the data non-Gaussian, certainly non-stationary because they come in intermittently. So we actually model these excesses as a collection of wavelets because they are a, um, concentrated in time and frequency. So it's sort of natural to uh, model them as in terms of wavelets. And so these are modeled as a sum of wavelets. And then the power, sorry, the, the signals are also, and I've shown this before, the signals are also measured, modeled as a sum of wavelets. So you take the collection of the red, purple, blue, orange, green, and light blue uh, wavelets here, you sum those up and you get the, uh, the overall blue line here, whereas the signal that we put in was in red. And so this collection of wavelets, which we don't know how many we need, we don't know what their frequencies or their uh, quality factor should be. Those are all explored by the algorithm and it puts it together and makes um, something like this. And while all of that is going on, we are also modeling the noise spectrum. So uh, this is actually a little movie. Um, on the left, it is showing the reconstruction of the, so this is in the frequency domain, the first two panels uh, in the Hanford and Livingston Observatory, and I'm, this is gonna be a movie in a moment, I'll set it running. And you'll see that the code is varying the uh, cubic spline component and this line model, these Lorentzians. So how many lines should there be in the model is forever varied and the height and the width of each of these Lorentzians. And we're also adding up wavelets here um, to reconstruct this excess in the data, which is actually in this case, a gravitational wave signal. And so this is, this is just snapshots from the, the chain. So you'll see on the left, you'll see some lines popping in and out of existence because it's trans-dimensional, it's trying out different lines. You'll see wavelets jumping around, it throws in a wavelet, uh, tries them out um, in different locations. And uh, then if those aren't producing much of a good fit, they sort of disappear from the model again. And then on the right is the aggregate that we get from uh, forming this up this collection of samples then into a probability distribution. And that's what I have behind me. This was the reconstruction of GW150914. So this was what was happening on that day uh, inside the computer as it as it did this modeling. It, it's fairly computationally intensive. These runs take hours. Uh, so it wasn't until later that night, uh, Bozeman time. So the signal came in in the morning. Um, we've got a trigger from coherent wave burst, which is a uh, low latency maximum likelihood wavelet technique, um, which actually picked this signal up first. And then that triggered our analysis to start running. And uh, by around about five or 6 p.m. Uh, Bozeman time that evening, we had these reconstructions and we were feeling pretty confident we detected a gravitational wave. So, um, but this was what was going on. We've, We've been, managed to speed up the analyses a bit since, but uh, it's quite computationally intensive to explore these high dimensional models. Um, just a little bit of an aside, and this is taken from the LIGO Virgo data guide, guide paper, uh, just about power spectral estimation. And I don't know if I, unfortunately I, I missed um, the LIGO open data grid, uh, um, or sorry, gravitational wave open science center. I think you had a little tutorial earlier today. Um, well, there's actually a, a tutorial that recreates most of the plots from that data guide paper. And here are some of the plots from it. 
So here is the Hanford data that actually contains uh, that first gravitational wave signal. You can't see it. It's a little tiny blip somewhere right around here that just doesn't show up at all on this scale because this is just the raw data is being shown in that top panel. And this is actually dominated by low frequency noise. So the first thing you have to do if you're Fourier transforming this, because as I said, most of the analyses are currently done in the Fourier domain. Uh, before doing this Fourier transform, you need to apply um, some kind of a window function, an appetizing window. In this case, we've used a, a Tukey window with a rise time of 0.4 seconds. So what it does is it basically sets the data to zero at either end and then smoothly um, rises up and becomes then flat across the rest of the data. And the reason that we have to do that is that Fourier transforms um, treat the data as being periodic. And so the problem is it doesn't match up at the different ends um, because we've just taken a slice of data that's not periodic, but we're now going to uh, you know, decompose it in a basis that assumes it is periodic. So before doing that, what we do is just flatten out the data at either end so that indeed it does actually match up at the two ends. Um, OK, good. Uh, thanks, Eric. <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely worth loading up that Jupyter notebook and, and, and uh, seeing how the analysis gets done. So we, we first of all um, apply this uh, window, then we Fourier transform it using a, a fast Fourier transform. And what you get, um, well, depends if you, in green is the so-called periodogram. It's just the magnitude squared of the Fourier coefficients at each frequency. Each of these frequencies is separated by one over the observation time, which in this case was four seconds. And if you, if you neglected to um, apply a window, the periodogram is this purple, um, these purple values here, which actually follows a one over F squared spectrum. And that's just purely, um, that's just purely spectral leakage because You've, you've assumed that the data was periodic and you fed it very non-periodic data. If you actually apply the window, you get this green spectrum here, which actually follows um, <clears throat> uh, Yeah, I'll get to this question about a stochastic background uh, a little later. Um, I'm not explicitly covering stochastic backgrounds in these lectures. Uh, but um, I will come back to that. Let me just uh, continue with this for a moment. So the green here is just the periodogram, just the sum, sorry, just the square of the Fourier coefficients. And then the black line here is what's known as a Welsh average. So what's been done is we've taken 4,000 seconds of data. It was either 4,000 or 2,000 seconds of data. We've broken it up into lots of little four second pieces We've estimated the spectrum, the, sorry, the periodogram for each of those four second segments, and then we've averaged them. And that's what Welsh, Welsh averaging is. And we end up with this black line. So it's what we get by averaging uh, thousands of these four second segments. Um, and we can use that. That's one of the ways that we might try and get a, an estimate for what the power spectrum is. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that only works if the spectrum is unchanging over time, because we're averaging together um, 4,000, sorry, about 1,000 different four second segments. And that's only going to converge to give us the spectrum if, if that um, noise level wasn't varying with time. And unfortunately, the LIGO Virgo data really isn't stationary over thousands of seconds, typically. So <clears throat> this averaging um, as a method is, is not very reliable. Uh, way to figure out what the power spectrum, power spectral density looks like. So we actually use somewhat more advanced techniques. So this here is the log likelihood, which is sometimes called the Whittle likelihood function. And here is our model now, S um, as a function of frequency, and it's just a discrete collection of frequencies here. And here is the periodogram. So <clears throat> you can now fit a model to your power spectrum, such as maybe a power law. <clears throat> and 
and then you would fit here for that parameter alpha. So this is these are known as this is known as Bayesian hyperparametrics, where you're actually modeling your likelihood function at the same time as modeling other things in the data. Um, so we've got the <clears throat> we can fit some function here to the uh, power spectrum. Now power law isn't usually going to be uh, sufficient, so we'll often fit. That's where we use our combination, say, of cubic splines and these Lorentzians, which does a better job than just a simple power law, right? So we actually fit this model, and we've got the periodogram here uh, in green, and we're fitting it with this, this model, and we do it using this uh, trans-dimensional modeling technique where, where the lines are placed and how many of them is, is a free parameter, and the spline, the control points of the spline are also a free parameter where they're placed and how many of them there are. So it's quite a complicated model that we fit um, simultaneously as we model also any gravitational waves that might be in the data. <clears throat> so yeah, what should I say about a stochastic background? Well, <clears throat> if I was to go all the way back um, to the very one of the, my beginning of the first lecture yesterday, I was saying that a stochastic gravitational wave signal is, de is described by a, um, say, a multivariate Gaussian distribution, potentially, if it's a Gaussian uh, stochastic background. And we want to then measure the spectrum of that. Well, that actually forms up a template. Uh, it's a stochastic template. We aren't necessarily in interested in the individual samples at each frequency. So we integrate those out, and that then leads, and I don't have slides for this, unfortunately, but there is a paper that I wrote with Joe Romano. Uh, we also wrote a review paper together, but there's another paper where we actually show that if you just marginalize out over those individual samples, you end up then with a cross-correlation statistic. So it becomes, uh, you basically end up cross-correlating the, the signal in different detectors the idea then is that the, the noise is hopefully uncorrelated between the detectors, whereas the stochastic signal um, is common to the detectors, and that allows you to distinguish between um, a stochastic gravitational wave signal and a uh, and just noise. In the case of a le you know something just like LISA, where you might only have a single detector uh, and you can't really do cross correlation, you then have to rely on the or hope that the um, noise is well enough understood in various ways uh, and that the spectrum of the noise differs from the spectrum of the stochastic background, you can separate it because they just have different power spectra. So you sort of break it out to components that are due to instrument noise and components that are due to a signal. In the case of, say, pulsar timing, we have, uh, you know, of order 50 pulsars that we're timing so we actually are working on the cross correlation between the, the the signal from the time series from each pulsar, and we're looking for um, a common correlated component between all the pulsars, which would be the gravitational wave signal, and then hopefully the noise is uncorrelated. And in fact, in the in in that case, we expect the correlation to depend on the angular separation between each pair of pulsars which then should follow this so-called Hellings and Downs curve. Um, so unfortunately, I, I am not covering uh, stochastic background analyses in these lectures, um, but uh, that was sort of a brief version of it. But I would direct you, I would recommend that a review paper that Joe Romano and I wrote that covers all of this in, in, uh, in detail for you. <clears throat> All right, so some of the challenges that I've already mentioned for gravitational wave data analysis, if the signals you know, are processing or eccentric, then we have to do, deal with a high dimension. So that would be something like an M research in, in LISA. With LISA, we've got this complicated time-dependent um, instrument response. We have, also have thousands of overlapping signals. And we also have to deal with, in the real world, the, the noise is not stationary, and it's also not Gaussian because we have these transients and so, for example, we might have an excess in power at some times, and how do we deal with that? So I'm going to say just a little bit about some of the, these challenges and how we deal with them. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things 
that I've been working on recently is how to handle uh, non-Gaussian noise, sorry, non-stationary and non-Gaussian noise. Um, I mentioned earlier that we tend to, well, in, in the case of LIGO-Virgo analyses, we they've traditionally been done in the Fourier domain because if the noise were stationary, then this um, the noise correlation matrix would be diagonal and inverting a diagonal matrix is very, um, very easy, right? So you end up with an order n uh, cost to invert the matrix and then doing the sum that appears in here uh, is also order n, where n is the number of data points. And so that's computationally tractable, whereas um, if it's non, uh, if the noise is non-stationary, this matrix is no longer diagonal, and so it gets very expensive to invert. Um, so one of the things I've been looking at is, okay, is the Fourier domain really the best way to uh, deal with non-stationary noise. And the reason that we went to the Fourier domain is that we had a diagonal noise correlation matrix. Well, let's go instead to a time frequency re uh, uh, representation using wavelets where we actually break it up into a discrete collection basis of, of, uh, of, these, of these wavelets. So instead of sinusoids, these are like localized. I showed pictures of them earlier, of examples of some of the wavelets. Uh, localized in time and frequency. And in fact, even if the noise is non-stationary, if it's something called locally stationary, that means it's sort of adiabatically varying, then the noise correlation matrix is diagonal in the wavelet domain. So again, inverting it is very cheap. Um, so uh, what I've been looking at is now, do, now performing analyses using in the wavelet domain, here's a wavelet transform actually of some LISA data. And you can actually see here that the uh, you actually have um, these lighter spots are where the signal is stronger. And that's actually the galactic binaries because as LISA moves around, it sweeps across the galaxy. And at certain times of the year, it's pointing more towards the center of the galaxy. And so we get a stronger response. And only some of these galactic binaries are going to be resolvable. The rest are going to just form like a effective like an effective noise and that's time variable over a year and so um, rather than just modeling the spectrum as being a function of frequency we measure it now as a what's known as a dynamic spectrum that is a spectrum that's a function of time and frequency and so instead of just using a spline which goes uh, in frequency we use a bicubic spline so it varies both in time and in frequency I've got an example here um, so here's just some simulated uh, noise that's both uh, correlated in time and also it changes in frequency. Sorry, the, uh, the spectrum is changing in time. You notice that these wiggles become much uh, wider, much larger wiggles um, during the central portion and then it sort of settles back down again. So this is an example of a non-stationary, uh, non-white it has, it has correlations in the time domain. Um, and here is the so-called dynamic spectrum given as a color map. So you see that um, it varies both in frequency, which is in the vertical direction and in time. So we have this, this region in here where the uh, noise is elevated and the spectrum actually changed. The spectral shape is a function of time. So uh, we're able to model that. And so this is modeling that took this data here and this is actually a model of its dynamic spectrum, which now varies in time and frequency. And uh, the nice thing is, and we, I, I showed in this paper here, that indeed uh, the, the noise is uncorrelated between different pixels in the time frequency representation. So it's a diagonal matrix, so it's really easy to invert. So inverting this um, remains uh, a cheap process. And then it turns out there's another unexpected benefit from going to the time frequency representation. So if I'm representing a signal in time and frequency, and I've got an example here of a bit of a chirp, um, <clears throat> here is frequency, here is time. The total number of data points, because this is a, a lossless representation of the data, so remember that when you go from the time domain to the frequency domain, if you have n, 
n values in the time domain, you also have n values in the frequency domain. Uh, the same goes for a discrete wavelet transform. There are n values, right? Well, it's two-dimensional now. So if there's a total of n values, that means the square root of n um, points in time and a square root of n points in frequency. And if you look at a particular harmonic of a gravitational wave signal, it's a line in this space. These lines also have dim dimension root n. There are root n points along this line. So now you might have multiple harmonics, but then you've got to sum up then a collection of root n uh, for each harmonic. Um, but each of the harmonics is root n points. So the waveforms <clears throat> um, only require of order root n points. And if you think about for LISA, one year of LISA data is something like um, uh, 30 million data points from one channel. So it's a lot, you know, the square root of 30 million is more in the thousands. So the computational cost drops by a factor of about a thousand by going and doing the calculations in the wavelet domain. So that is why we are, as I mentioned yesterday, in the process right now of switching all of our codes across to using wavelet domain waveforms because it, um, the cost of calculating them is so much cheaper than uh, Fourier domain or time domain. Um, and so this is all described in a paper I published last year and we have these rapid and we're going to be making, uh, there's already quite a few codes we've made public. We're going to put together a, a general purpose code that will take your favorite waveform, whether it's um, a post-Newtonian waveform or a EOB waveform or a, a phenom model waveform. Uh, and it can be either in the time domain or the frequency domain because that's how people have been deriving those so far. And it will just instantly give you the uh, wavelet domain waveform um, with just a routine cost. So we're providing a general package to do all waveforms now in the wavelet domain. And so it's massively more um, efficient than working in time or frequency because the signals are localized in time frequency is basically why the savings occurring. And you only have to calculate the likelihood along this line. So the likelihood cost also scales as root n. Um, so uh, this not only can you model the non-stationary noise, the computational cost is a fraction of the traditional analyses. So um, I think this is the way to go in the future. Um, anyway, enough, enough of my advertising campaign. Uh, just my final topic here is how do we deal with um, this is something we're increasingly seeing in our LIGO analyses. So the first example of this is was GW170817, the binary neutron star merger. Here is again is a time frequency plot. Um, and here's the Livingston data. I'll get to that question in a moment. I'll just uh, finish my thought here. This is um, this here is a enormous noise transient. It had signal to noise of about 800. Um, <clears throat> It's a really an int instrument artifact that actually is quite coherent, so it has a signal to noise. And we have a signal to noise like 20 ish um, binary neutron star, and the two overlap. This is happening all the time now. Here is GW1909 24, and then details on its uh, extra digits here in Livingston. This has a, a glitch intersecting the, the signal track. So, what we do using Bayes' wave is we subtract out these glitches and we do it coherently, and then we can, these lower panels show the Bayes wave subtracted um, data. And we are now doing this simultaneously. Uh, so this is an example from a paper I wrote recently with Katerina and Marcella, where um, <clears throat> here's an example where we injected a signal into uh, the LIGO, uh, Livingston and Hanford. And at the time in, in, in Livingston, there was this big scattered light um, disturbance, which is sort of shown here in uh, orange. Here's the Livingston data. There's the signal. And then these other blobs here, which are quite loud, um, are these scattered light glitches. And the analysis simultaneously fits for the, uh, the signal here using, um, using waveform templates. In fact, in this case, it was using the Phenom D model, just a simple, a simple model. Um, 
here is what we get when we uh, it infers the model for the glitch and it subtracts it out. There you see the signal. And now if we take away our signal model, we're left with just, just Gaussian noise. So this is now simultaneously fitting for signals and glitches, which means that the interaction between those two gets taken into account. So um, this is the, uh, the latest uh, thing that we're doing in LIGO data analysis is to simultaneously model the non-stationary, non-Gaussian noise components. We were also modeling the spectrum at the same time, and we we're also modeling this using templates simultaneously. So I think that for the LIGO uh, 04 observing run, this will become pretty much the standard, I hope, of how we handle these um, intersection of noise transients and uh, signals. So. Um, in the chat, there was a question, are the potential drawbacks for the wavelet domain approach? Um, I don't really, I mean, you know, any method, uh, I guess, has certain limitations. I think that uh, the, the main thing that we're going to be dealing with for a moment is just people's unfamiliarity with with say wavelet representations, um, people are very used to, you know, a Fourier transform or a time domain. I think people are getting fairly familiar now with seeing plots, uh, so-called spectrogram uh, plots. Uh, but the these wavelet transforms, um, I've derived kind of the wavelet equivalent of a of a stationary phase approximation. So we have rapid ways to um, calculate the we don't actually have to use a wavelet transform to um, calculate the waveforms. We can just directly calculate it, just like you know, just like we do with a um, uh, stationary phase approximation, where we uh, you know go directly from the time domain to the uh, frequency domain without actually having to use a a fast Fourier transform. We can do the same with the wavelets. So uh, speed-wise, it's extremely extremely quick. I don't know. That answers your question, but um, I'm not really seeing any disadvantages. I see a, a vast number of advantages, and I see that Eric also has his hand up. Yes, Eric, uh, please go on, and then Alexandre. Hi, Neil. Um, yes. Can you can you go back to to the slide you shown earlier on the wavelet transform of that chirp? Uh, yes, I just stopped accident accidentally stopped sharing. I'll share again. Uh, Right, this one. Right. Yeah. Uh, here we see that um, the, the, the chirp is chirping, but it's not uh, tremendously chirping as, for instance, what we see close to the merger, right? Where, right. where the chirping rate is, uh, is much higher than, than, than what we see here. Mm -hmm. uh, I presume, I mean, this is, this is LISA data, so I don't expect to find exactly the same features. However, I guess that this matters, right, in the quality of the approximation that uh, you get for a fixed wavelet with a defined uh, uh, du duration or right, bandwidth. Right. Yes. So um, it's true that the uh, you are free to choose. So each of these wavelets has a time frequency area of one half. So uh, delta F times delta T always equals a half. But you can you could either make them broader in frequency or broader in time, right? So as long as the product is a half. And so absolutely, the representation can be more efficient, you know, during uh, the final stages uh, as the uh, as it becomes very steep, you might want to have much finer resolution in time and broader in frequency, for example. Um, but for this method, it doesn't actually matter. Um, because we're not, this is not a wavelet based analysis. This is just using the, this is unlike, you know, co coherent wave burst or Bayes wave. We're not actually representing the signal um, using wavelets, really. We're just using it in the same way that the Fourier representation is just a, you know, a particular decomposition. We're not actually doing a wavelet analysis. We're doing a template based analysis, but we're just uh, calculating its wavelet decomposition. Um, and so we've actually, this method works no matter how steep the signal is. It actually has a transition. There's a, 
the way that you calculate the transform depends on the uh, steepness of the the track and time frequency. So it actually switches from one method. They actually overlap in their uh, validity, but we switch from using a method when the track's fairly uh, shallow in time frequency, and then it's a slightly different uh, method that we use once they become very steep, and, and the codes actually just automatically switch from one regime to the other. And like I said, there's a significant overlap where the two methods are, are valid. Um, so it just transforms it to a discrete uh, wavelet basis, but fundamentally it's still a uh, an analytically defined waveform here. So uh, it's just a way to get it into the discrete wavelet domain and then we just do the calculations in the wavelet domain, but it's not a wavelet-based analysis like coherent wave burst, which actually needs the power to be very well concentrated in a small number of pixels for the method to work. Same with Bayes wave, really. Bayes wave likes to, you know, pick the wavelet so it concentrates the power. Here, it doesn't really matter if it's spread uh, because we just add up the pixels anyway. If you don't choose the basis very well, you you know, you can see that it's spread over about, in this case, about typically 10-ish wavelets. Um, that 10 multiplies this root n. So picking uh, an appropriate basis here um, can kind of cut, keep the computational cost down but as far as the wavelet spacings that we use, that's mostly determined by the noise. So we like to keep the extent in time uh, small compared to the time scale over which the noise level is varying. So we, we basically, that's the main, in choosing our wavelets, that's what's mostly guiding it. Um, right, if I, if, if I may, I, I think the point I wanted to, uh, to check with you was, uh, this uh, root n scaling, right? I expect that this is valid for a certain range of duration of wavelet. I can imagine that uh, if I reanalyze the data that you're showing with a very short wavelet, then many of the coefficients that I would have would be, would be, would, would right. be, right, uh, add an amplitude, yeah, so, right? So that therefore the, yeah. the score, the, the sparsity that you observe would not it's, be that's right okay. so so in fact um these wavelet transformations as you know go all the way from the time domain to the frequency domain so you can actually go all the way to having say a single layer in frequency which means you're back in the time domain right or you can go all the way to having like a single layer you know in time and then you're fully in the frequency domain. So in between, you'll have sort of some mix. And you're absolutely right. The coefficient in front of the root n can can change, and it can get as large as root n, in which case you're back to a scaling with n, right? So uh, the sparsity, uh, yeah, there is a prefactor in front of the, the root n. It's order sort of 10-ish, typically. But um, and at least for the practical, for the kinds of signals that we're looking at for LIGO and Virgo and, and LISA, we are getting, you know, of the cost is of order 10 times root n um, for typical wavelet decompositions that we use. So we do get we do get a significant speed up still, but it's not, you know, it's not n compared to root n because there is a prefactor, but uh, for n large, it's still a huge savings. So these codes are dramatically faster than the traditional ones in real real life applications. Okay. okay, thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you, yes. So the next question was from Alexandre to Biana. Yes, thank you. So it's a kind of a follow-up question on my previous one concerning possible drawbacks or limitations. And actually, you might already have partially answered, but for instance, if you wanted to use this method to constrain modifications from general relativity to look for deviations from behind the signal, mm -hmm. so how, how would it be? Well, really, again, it's just a basis in the same way that, you know, we can conduct analyses in the time domain, we can conduct it in the frequency domain, it's just a, it repackages the data in a lossless way, but just in a different basis, right? So it's just changing the basis that we've, that we've decomposed our time series into. So it's exactly the same if you want to do tests of general relativity, and you've got a waveform 
And then you have, say, a waveform that includes modifications. So you might be, you know, changing the coefficients in the post-Newtonian expansion, like like we do in some of the LIGO analyses. That's still just a waveform. I can give you the wavelet transform of that just by this general method. And then it just gets calculated. You know, the inner products just get done in the wavelet domain. So it's it's really just a a different way of representing the data, but these are still using exactly the same um, waveform. So those of those of you on the call that calculate post-Newtonian waveforms don't have to worry. I'll take I'll take the way you calculate waveforms currently, and that's totally fine. I can use you know a time domain waveform. I can use a frequency domain waveform, and this method just directly transforms it to the wavelet domain starting from either time domain or frequency domain waveforms. So I can I can work with either one and you don't have to change the way you calculate your waveforms. Um, it just totally takes existing waveforms um, as they're coded up and we just directly uh, get them in the wavelet domain. Okay, okay. I think it's clear, thank you. Okay, then uh, Ilsang Yun had a question. Uh, you can ask uh, the question yeah, by yourself see. if you like. Yes, yeah, so I'll read out the question. It's if you still find an outstanding residual after this glitch, uh, glitch subtraction, what do you suggest to do? Does it mean that the subtraction is not perfect? Well, we never have any residual left because by uh, because the code will just keep on adding in wavelets till it's by definition it gets it down to Gaussian noise because the likelihood says that it should be Gaussian noise. The sufficient flexibility in adding the wavelets in, it, it never leaves behind a residual by construction because it will just add wavelets. If there's a residual, it'll take them away. And so by definition, what's left after Bayes wave has run is always just Gaussian noise because if there's anything that's not signal, so if it's not coherent across the network, if there's anything in there that's say a noise transient, it just throws wavelets at it until it subtracts them. So just by oh. construction, it always leaves behind Gaussian noise. I see. Thanks. Okay. So my question was actually, it's, you know, somewhat, you know, the misinterpretation of your slide then on one fourteen, which I thought there is a little bit of it, the bleep, the after the glitch subtraction in the bottom left. Bottom left. Um, oh that yeah. Guy. That guy. This, yeah. I actually, so I lied to you slightly. Um, this actual subtraction was done doing using something called quick CBC, not Bayes wave. It's a approximate maximum likelihood um, method that's extremely fast. Uh, so I actually lied to you. This was not Bayes wave does a very similar thing, but Bayes waves uh, subtraction actually doesn't leave any little bits left behind. Uh, this is a very fast maximum likelihood method that does leave. What's actually happening there is there's a 60 hertz um, line right in there that rings off on the wavelets and there's a little bit of residual getting left there. Bayes wave will can keep on iterating and it would not actually even leave that little blip behind. So this is the this is actually what's used as the sort of starting step for Bayes wave. These subtractions are just the initial solutions. But if you actually if I was to show you the same subtractions done by Bayes wave, there's actually nothing left there. Okay, I see. Thank you. Very good. So any more question at this stage? No, I cannot see any. So you, you can go on, I guess. Uh, no, actually, I've, I've actually run out of slides. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I wanted to, I'm happy just to discuss a bit more or you'd always, you know, end a little early, but if there was anything back from earlier in the presentations that anyone wants to go back to and ask questions about, I'm happy to take questions about anything. Um, okay, so um, I maybe I can start. Um, so uh, I, I remember vaguely that there are convergent CRMs about uh, MCMC. Uh, can you remind that? And uh, um, so the convergence, yeah. Yes, um, I, there are mathematical CRMs, uh, but I don't right. quite remember them. That's right. So um, let's just, I uh, don't really need a slide for this, but I'll just bring one up for um, fun anyway. Um, <clears throat> yes, so there are mathematical, so maybe I'll put this slide up. There are mathematical theorems that said, say that 
if your proposal allows access to the entire prior volume, that is, your proposal distribution's got to be able to apply, you know, propose jumps that can take you anywhere eventually, um, that no matter uh, what the what proposal distribution you use, uh, you will eventually converge to the posterior distribution by applying this um, sampling over and over. So uh, the, in practice, the problem is that could take the age of the universe or longer, right? So, you know, these theorems, while they're comforting, that you will eventually reach this stationary distribution if you just, no matter how crappy your proposal is, in practice, you don't have that, you know, infinite computational resources. So the efficiency of the algorithm uh, is quite dependent on the, on the proposals. And there are various theorems that show things like, um, this is kind of an interesting one. So yesterday when I was talking about grid searches and if I want to lay out a grid in parameter space, the cost of covering a high dimensional, so suppose you wanted to search for Emory signals and so something like a 15 to 17 dimensional parameter space and you wanted to lay out a grid, the cost of that search scales geometrically with the dimension. So it's vastly expensive to search using a grid and completely out of, there's just no way we could do it. There's no, we don't, unless we have quantum computers, we cannot do a grid search for Emory's. The beauty of Markov Chain Monte Carlo is that instead of exploring the entire space, it focuses its intention, its attention on the region occupied by regions of high likelihood. So it kind of locks onto a much smaller subset of the full dimension. And there are theorems that say um, that the cost of a uh, of certain kinds of Markov chain Monte Carlos, say scale is maybe dimension squared rather than geometrically. And ideally, in principle, you can get a Markov chain Monte Carlo where the cost is actually linear in the in the model dimension. That's really realized in practice. Very rarely do you get such a good um, algorithm that it can actually scale, the cost scales linearly with dimension. But, uh, you know, Scaling linearly in dimension versus geometrically in dimension is a huge factor um, for these high dimensional spaces. I think we, we haven't got particularly good data on it for things like Bayes' wave, but it does seem that we are not too far off this linear scaling uh, in dimension because we're up in dimension thousands. And for the, the Lisa analyses, um, for the, say, the galactic binaries, our algorithms there, our codes are actually running at dimension 150,000 right now and converging. So with 150,000 dimensions. Um, so I think again, we must be fairly close to this linear scaling and dimensionality. Uh, we need to do some more tests, uh, just comparing, okay, how does it vary depending on the amount of data that we're putting in and how many signals we're actually extracting. But I think we're fairly close to this linear scaling. But like, like I said, there's theorems that prove that the scaling is fast far less than, than uh, geometric in the dimension as well. Okay, thank you very much. So are there other questions? Maybe people had uh, time to, to think about one. Can I ask one more question? Yes, yes, sure. Yeah, it's at first, you know, I apologize if you already addressed this, but I missed a the part of your talk in the beginning, but the, it's about a, the model selection. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how, in practice, how this model selection applied in this, you know, the, the model inference of the gravitational wave, especially for, as you already mentioned, the model has a very large dimension. I mean, the, it's actually rigorous, you know, the model selection in the Bayesian is based on the marginal likelihood, which is right. computationally very expensive. Are you yes. actually computing this or are you, are you using some different approximation? We are. We are computing it. Um, in my group, we mostly compute it two ways. One way is we use thermodynamic integration, which is a particular method uh, described on this slide. 
is which couples in with these parallel chains. Um, a lot of groups are using nested sampling, which uh, naturally gives you the evidence. Um, of course, it has error bars on it. Uh, once we get into these very high dimensional models, um, we actually rely on the trans-dimensional um, jumping between the models because then the relative amount of time spent in each model gives you their evidence ratios. So if it's spending sort of 99% of its time in one model and 1% of its time in another model, that's a, uh, that's a uh, base factor, or in this case, actually fully an, yeah, an odds ratio of 100. So we actually get it from the time spent in the different models gives you the, just the ratios of the evidence between the different models. So most of what we do now, we get these evidence ratios, base factors, just by the trans the transdimensional um, method where it just spends more time in the preferred model. So it's literally a histogram. That's all that's involved. Okay, thank you very much. More questions? Um, maybe I can ask uh, another one then. Yeah. Uh, about uh, about the measurement of uh, the spin parameter. Yes. Um, you explained that uh, it's uh, always easier to measure spins when uh, there is precession. Right. Uh, I was wondering, in, in the absence of precision, uh, what uh, signal-to-noise ratio would be needed to, to be sure that uh, spin uh, is non-zero and, and to know quite well its value, let's say, at 95%, uh, something like this? Right. So here's an explicit example for you. And <clears throat> so GW170817 illustrates this it's the degeneracy. So the spin, um, so the spin, in addition to, as you know, in, in addition to causing those modulations of the waveform, the amplitude modulations, which we often can't see, it also changes the phasing, right? As I, as you know, of course, you've calculated a lot of those phasing terms yourself, um, responsible for some of these expressions. So these phasing terms, um, so also it changes the phasing, but the problem is, there's degeneracies in the way that the spins change the phasing and the way the masses affect the phasing, right? And that is illustrated here that, in fact, if we just assumed that the spins were zero, which would be, you know, an extreme version of this um, kind of constraint here on the spins, then we'd be narrowed down, the masses would be narrowed down to this little tiny area right here. Um, so this giant uh, degeneracy is due to the spins, right? So this, the spin impacts on the phasing for this in spiral of a binary neutron star system is, is what's causing this huge degeneracy. Um, and if we don't restrict the range of the spins, like this is the blue one, so if we just leave the spins to range over their full range, we end up with this giant banana. And I forget the exact um, signal to noise of this system, it was around 20 something, maybe 24. Um, and you can see the extent, right? It extends uh, for the individual masses. This is extending, extending for mass uh, one between about, you know, 1.3 and maybe 2.8 solar masses. Um, so as you dial up the signal to noise, the length of this line will shrink as one over the signal to noise. So if we went up to say signal to noise 200, make this 10 times louder, this would shrink by a factor of 10. So it would shrink down to a much smaller region um, and be much better determined. So you can see at signal to noise 20, we still had this wide range, which really didn't tell us, you know, if it was definitely a neutron star or whether maybe it was a, you know, a small black hole, but if it was 10 times louder, this would have shrunk by a factor of 10. So uh, you need pretty significant signal to noise to really nail this down. Because right now these are, you know, plus or minus, I mean, these are almost like 50% errors on the masses, right? 
So if you want to get it down to a 5% mass, you would need it to be 10 times larger, louder. Okay. Okay, thank you. Which will happen with the next generation of detectors, but uh, yeah, with ET and and uh, Cosmic Explorer, will you know it'll be say ten or more times louder, and so there'll be much better constraint. Indeed. <laughs> okay, more questions. Uh, yes, I have one question. Yes, yes. go on. Uh, it's about the wavelet transform that you you use. Yes. Uh, so if you want to, you say that uh, we can choose uh, our favorite wavelet transform. But if you want to to use the same transform with uh, all uh, all the points. So for example, you you want to use the same wavelet transform uh, for the localization. You you want to use the wavelet transform with where the the time delay, the time shift is quite fast. So, for example, right. <clears throat> um, the wavelet transform, which can do that. Yeah. So the wavelet transform I'm using, um, it's described in that paper. It's, uh, it's a. Th this method works with any kind of discrete wavelet transform, but the one that um, I was using was actually one that. Uh, Sergei Klemenko and uh, uh, I forget his first name, but Nekula is his uh, yeah, surname. Orthonormal basis, yes. It's an orthonormal basis, yes. but it's very nice because it uses, even though it's a wavelet transform, it has a very close relationship with um, Fourier transforms. So there's a lot of techniques in there that are very particular to that wavelet transform that allow uh, allow the calculation of the wavelet transform to be really fast, um, including this sort of transforming along the tracks. But in principle, the the method would work with any discrete wavelet transform, but I just found the one, that particular wavelet transform, um, to be really, uh, have certain properties that made it very efficient for, for, doing, um, for doing the fast transforms. So the, uh, yeah, so it's the it's the same one that coherent wave burst now uses as, as their transform basis. Um, it's a very nice um, discrete wavelet basis. Okay, thank you. They're called Wilson. They're WDM wavelets. Yeah. Wilson orthonormal basis. Yeah. So, but any in principle, any any basis would work, but that one has some really nice properties. There is still time for additional questions. Uh, no, <laughs> people are maybe a bit tired after yeah. uh, it's been a day long of meeting lectures. For... Yep. <laughs> yep, it's time okay, in so... Europe to, uh, you know, head out yes. and relax for the evening. Yes, exactly. Okay, so uh, as I cannot see any more questions, I, I think maybe we, we could uh, stop here. Uh, thank you again. Um, thanks to everyone. And um, I will stop the recording here. All right. Well, thank you.